Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix Mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And today, before we get into what I'm here to talk about, I want to first announce the winner of the uh, quiz that we had for video number 100 of the Moshix Mainframe channel. Uh, if you look at uh, the video that I had released um, maybe about a week ago, M100, I, I had asked two questions during the video. One uh, was, um, what operating system this uh, I produced this uh, just two output message or number of messages and uh, let's make it a little bit bigger or even uh, can make it full screen yeah so I'd ask what operating system had produced these messages and if you had looked at one of my previous videos where I looked at some uh, very ancient prints that I had received from a friend out in Florida I had said that uh, when IBM made them their operating systems, they had called the messages produced by MFT, which is one of the predecessors, uh, so to say, of MBS. They had RF messages in the temporary data sets. And then the ones produced by MVT had uh, RV in it, so that um, you could tell them apart by that. And Everything after that, MVS and OS 390 and ZOS, they have um, temporary message data sets called RA, because for a while IBM meant to call MVS the Advanced Operating System, AOS, but they never did. But the by, while they were developing the operating system, they put in an A here to um, to signify MV, the what be, effectively became MVS. And so F here means MFT, uh, V means MVT and A means MVS and the was 390 and ZOS and later. So uh, this is one of the questions and the answer would be MVT. Uh, that's, so the operating system here was MVT 21.8. And then I, sh I had another question which related to the use of the translate instruction. And I, as you can see here, I developed, I wrote this program which uh, was using a translate table to translate a string this string over here into an uh, into an output string using a translation table that I built during the, yeah, here's a translation table while I wrote this program. So the question was, what will this string here translate into? And of course, uh, some people uh, came back and said, well, the translate instruction is actually easy to understand because it exists very, in a very similar fashion also on the x86 instruction set and there it's called xlat for translate but the unpack instruction is where some people had difficulty um, because the unpack instruction unpacks uh, numbers or data in, on the mainframe instruction set architecture uh, to remove uh, one half byte from every byte and so <laughs> And so the trick here was you needed to first look how translate worked, but before that, you also needed to understand how the unpack assembler instruction works. And so um, when I uh, released this, I got three answers back, re uh, valid answers. And uh, all three said that, this, that it, it is, as I just said, the MVT 21, version 21.8 operating system that wrote those just two messages. And they said that this string here translates them to coffee time. Um, and as I said, uh, it's really not hard. And I, I gave a few hints during the video. As you can see here, now that if I say here, uh, coffee time, it actually fits in perfectly. And and here's the translate table for that, uh, as you can see here. So these uh, were the answers. Maybe a little bit a tad difficult, but for most followers of this channel, not that hard. I think a lot of people also came back and uh, gave me additional names of people to thank other than of course the, the usual ones like Fish and Ivan Warren and uh, Professor René Ferland and, and many many others who have uh, Sam Golub. So um, so this is, uh, I, I got three valid answers. One from, let's go back here um, in the comments, one from one Mr. Uh, where is he? Yeah, here he is, from one Mr. Grigori Trenin. I don't know where he's from, but uh, Grigori, please come forward. Uh, contact me by email so I can send you the mainframe. 
uh, that you won, the S370, uh, I think model 148 mainframe that you have won. I'll send it to you wherever you are in the world. If I'm allowed to, obviously can, can't send anything to North Korea or, or Somalia or other countries like that. But um, uh, any other civilized place, I'll be happy to, uh, to send you the, uh, the mainframe you won. So this was the first answer you can see. Then a, Mr. a gentleman, a young gentleman, uh, whom I actually know from the from the uh, chat channel that we have going on on uh, what is the channel channel called again? I actually don't remember, but there is a a chat channel that I had set up um, maybe seven eight months ago, nine months ago, which I actually don't even really go to so much because I don't have the time. But he's there very often, and he also answered. Um, uh, he said. Uh, OS360 MVT and coffee time. So, and then I got one by email, which which actually disqualifies because we said it needs to be by comment, so that um, so we can see the time sequence. But the answer came from such a, a renowned gentleman that I actually um, I take it as a valid answer, even though it's a late answer. And th that answer actually came from no other than Sam Gollop. Uh, here, this gentleman here, the creator and maintainer of the CBT tape. Uh, Sam Golub is royalty in the mainframe world um, and so certainly belongs to the elders of the community. And so I count his answer as correct as well. So we have three answers, but the winner is Grigori Trenin. Um, so Grigori, um, I assume you probably speak some Slavic language, I would assume, maybe Russian. And with the address and I'll send you the uh, the uh, S370 mainframe so that's it now that we've put this aside I'm going to talk today about something quite exciting we have on uh, on my Moshix uh, mainframe uh, the VM370 mainframe that we have running by the way uninterrupted for I think about a month right now let's see yes so this was IPL 30 days ago um, so it, has, it never goes down, very reliable. We have, um, other than DOS VS, of, and of course, Professor Onofono is making a series about that, and, uh, and MVS 3.8, we have a third guest operating system, and that's OS VS version one. And it's a very special operating system, number one, because it's very hard to find. Uh, it has almost completely disappeared. Uh, but also because it has some very interesting features. So let me go and tell you a little bit about OSVS1, which is the topic of the discussion today. So uh, present. So if you look at the history of the IBM mainframe operating systems, uh, the first version that came out with the S360 mainframe, the one that was released in 1965, was of course OS360. You could get OS360 in two flavors, either with um, First, of course, you know, it was just OS 360. Then later on, they made uh, with the S370 architecture that was announced, I think, in 1971 or made available in 1971, maybe even a little bit earlier, 1970. They had two versions of operating systems with partitions so that you could run uh, address bases with the same addressing scheme, but they would be separate from each other. Kind of a predecessor of address bases today that were called partitions. And one had, was called OS uh, operating system MFT, multiple fixed tasks. So you could, uh, uh, you could run m uh, multiple fixed tasks. You had to decide at IPL time how many partitions you had. And then within that, you had to run your, uh, your uh, applications. The problem with that was that often you had maybe an application was slightly too big for the partition size that, would, uh, that was otherwise available for it. And so you had to wait maybe until a bigger partition will become available. And so not very flexible, but it did its job and many, many hundreds of installations worldwide were running MFT. MFT then released a second version called uh, OS MFT version two. And from there it went to then OS VS one, which itself had several releases, I think seven releases. So the last one was announced 1983. So, um, so the first release of an OS VS1 was 1971, and the last update was in 1983. Uh, and then IBM told people they needed to migrate to either MVS or to MVS XA. And so in parallel, 
you also had OS MVT and um, that was available at the same time. And how that worked is that whenever you, back then, if you remember, you had to sysgen, you had to generate the operating system from a huge number of assembly macros and you had to go and put in all the right values on those macros and then you would run a job and they would assemble for you, create a, a, a binary of the operating system that was meant for your particular situation, for your particular machine, for your peripherals and for your configuration of that operating system. So you could generate for either MFT or for MVT. It was the same code base. And remember back then everything was in open source. And so from the same source code, you could either assemble MFT and an MFT operating system for your mainframe or an MVT. Obviously, typically an IBM system engineer uh, would, would do that task for the client uh, because a few clients well, maybe some had the knew how to do it, but the people, it was so important, people didn't want to mess it up. And so an IBM SE or system engineer would typically do it for them. So an MVT was released at the same time. An MVT stands for multiple variable tasks. So you could have partitions that were variable in size. And so once you have a partition that's variable in size, you really have, you're really just one step away from a full address space configuration. And the big difference here is that when OS VS1 was announced, uh, VS stands for virtual storage or virtual memory. So when they announced virtual storage, it would allow for only one virtual address space to be run. And so all the partitions were inside the one virtual address space. And whereas MVT took another route and then and, and announced an OS VS2 release one, which was called SVS for a short time, and then evolved into OS VS2 release two, which was also called at the same time MVS. And then from MVS, it went to several, several iterations. MVS SP, which was a significant release, which is the one we don't have because that's the one first release that's not open in the, in the uh, open source anymore. And then from there it went to 31-bit, MBS XA, ESA, or 319 COS. So this is what survives today, this line, this lineage here. This didn't survive because IBM told them you need to move to MBS. So here you have multiple address spaces. Every application, just like in Unix um, or Windows, every application has its own fully protected address space. Whereas here, you wouldn't have typically you wouldn't have full protection. You could have some protection, but not full protection of, of all your control tables of every of every application. Whereas here you have full protection from other uh, processes and programs running on the same system. So OS VS1 has almost disappeared. You can find lots of MBS distribution libraries. It's easy to find stuff in this family here. Very, very hard to find anything after OS MFT. This we still have available. Uh, that you can find on the internet. Uh, OS MFT2 you can't really find. OS VS1 had almost completely disappeared except for one gentleman in Argentina who made it available. Uh, what's also very hard to find, we have, except MBS SP, very hard to find because IBM won't release it to us. We have MBS of course, we don't have SVS really, I haven't been able to find it, but we do have, do have MVT. And um, and then you can you can download I guess from BitTorrents MVS ESA or 319 ZOS. Those can be downloaded. You cannot legally run them, but you can download them. And then MVS XA is something that is still nowhere to be found. Um, and I really wish IBM would release MVS XA to the hobbyist um, community so we could play with 31-bit and bring in huge innovation to this um, to this mainframe. Uh, environment so we could make the mainframe great again to use uh, a political analogy and all we really want to do in the Hercules community is make the mainframe great again so anyway so today I, I did we did somebody sent me an OS VS1 um, image and we're gonna run it today and see what's different with that so enough history let's go to the terminal so you can see here I am connected to my um, VM 370 mainframe in the cloud and let me get out of this. And I'm gonna uh, log on OS VS1. I'm gonna start the virtual machine and the IPL OS VS1 in it. Oops.
Okay, so we logged in and maybe I'll start one more instance so that I can show you that we have uh, what users are connected here. So let's do that. Dial CP watch. Everybody can connect to the Moshix VM370 mainframe and run that command. And you can see now that we have OSVS1 just logged in, but we haven't IPL'd it yet. And by the way, here I have another window where I have uh, where I am main the maintainer, so I can I can start to do stuff. So um, why don't we IPL? I know that it's disk. If I do, so this is the only disk that we have available. That's a 3350, I think. So we IPL from that. Uh, specify virtual storage size. I'm not going to say anything. So now. It wants to specify system and or set parameters. It wants a date because the time of the time of day clock is invalid. So uh, we're going to say reply zero zero date equals just say any date doesn't really matter clock Okay. And now it wants to know the time of day clock, but not GMT, not Greenwich. It wants to know the local one. So I just say clock equals 10.10.10 without GMT. So that's local time. Okay. So system restart is in progress. It wants to know why we are IPLing. So I want to. So now it's bringing up the system, SMF, the system management uh, facility, to measure what's going on in the system. And now we say we start the printers, the writers. And we say see here why is that no huh. um. uh, it's not finding those images let's see What the manual says. Um, oh, okay, I know what. Uh, so. Let's see what the outstanding replies are. Okay, this IPL went wrong, so why don't we shut down again? And try this again. Uh, okay, so let's try this again. Then we say QN Okay Then we say STD2 Yes And STD2 That's the image for the printer That it's looking for So that's it So the operating system is now up you can see here when I say display activity, it's a kind of different output from MBS because you chose as partitions, partition one, partition two, partition three, partition four. And 
even though there is a Jess here, it's called Jess 1. So we've looked at Jess 2 in the past extensively. I even have a video where I look at Jess 3, which is a clustering uh, job entry subsystem from IBM for um, that we have uh, we revived with help from a gentleman called Kevin Leonard. And but we never looked at Jess 1. And may, most people don't know that actually there was a Jess 1, and Jess 1 is the Jess the job entry subsystem that goes with OS VS1, and that's what we're looking at right now. So a JS1 doesn't use the terminology from, from the normal JS2 that we know. It still uses the partition and reader and writer um, uh, terminology. And the other terminology we should know is init. Init means initiator. So an initiator is still exists also in JS2 today. An initiator is almost like imagine like a ready-made address space that's they're just waiting for it to attach and load a task and start executing. And uh, today in the Unix world, we launch address spaces whenever we need. Even when you do a simple list command to list the uh, directory on Linux, it's you're actually launching an address space. Back in the early 70s, setting up an address space was a very, very expensive operation. And you wouldn't want to just set up an address space just at the whim of, a, of any command. So you would actually start several address spaces called initiators and they would be waiting for a task to attach to it and then executing. So we, the, the address space was already uh, working. And then when everything was, was, was finished, the task would detach from the initiator and the initiator would return again to the pool of available initiators to start tasks. Writer, readers are of course the readers that read from the card punch. And so you had one reader for each card, um, for each card reader. And then you had writers for each printer. And so we have several printers here defined, about I think four or five. And what we're gonna to try today, and then you of course you have several commands like show requests, um, no outstanding requests. You also have some just like um, commands like show queues. So here you would have a command that shows the input output queues. And you can see here we have one, two, three queues and the 7% spool utilization. So spool is a very clear indicator that we have a job entry subsystem running because spool is something that came with the JS2 and JS3 and JS1 um, spooling um, programs for the IBM mainframe. They, I, don't, I don't think they invented it technically uh, speaking from a history point of view, but they kind of brought it to the, to the big masses. And um, JS2 used to be called Houston Automatic Spool Program because it was written in Houston by a couple of IBM contractors for NASA. And, uh, and so this shows you that we have a job entry subsystem running. You can also show everything that's, uh, all the jobs that are waiting to be executed. So there's a couple of jobs here. So now that we have this running, what we need to understand is that since this is running as a virtual machine inside BM370, my user here can actually send messages to this OSVS1. And by how do we do that? We pipe actually the punch of this virtual machine, which is my user mained. Every, as you know, every user, every time sharing or interactive user on VM370 is running in her own virtual machine. And every virtual machine has a reader, a punch and the, and the, and the printer. So what we can do is punch because punch cards have to be 80 bytes by definition. So it's a perfect fit for the reader because readers are also 80, 80 bytes long cards. So we can connect our punch, our virtual punch inside this interactive users uh, virtual machine to the reader of OS VS1. So if I punch something, it will, in this user, it will actually be delivered to this OS VS1 virtual machine and the reader will, will, will um, will then forward it to the operating system to OS, OS VS1, which will process it, and then all the output then in turn will be on the printer. And this printer is actually connected to the reader, again, the virtual reader of this virtual machine. So as you can see, it's kind of inverse. The, the punch of this virtual machine goes to the reader of this virtual machine, and the printer and punch of this virtual machine go to the reader of this virtual machine. So we can use this to submit jobs from just like Professor Onefalon did with DOS, DOS VS, we can do this with OS VS1. So I have here a job, uh, which I call job one OS VS1, as you can see here, and it's an assembler job. I'm just, very simple job. I, 
I have a simple program in assembler that prints something on the console. Okay. Um, so let's send this to this machine here to, to assemble and to give us the output back. I actually don't want to run it. Let's do it like this. Just compile without execution because I right now I don't want to execute anything. So uh, I can do a spool punch to SVS1. This is how I tell my virtual machine that my punch here is going to be connected with this reader here. So done. Now I can do punch job one OSVS1 no header. So I don't want any header, any print header to be to be written. So it's just the pure punch cards. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, punch job one OSVS1 and now we should see here some activity. Let's see. Yes. So it received the as you can see here received some work on the on the card reader uh, so the card reader forwarded to the nucleus which uh, connected with an initiator it it ran and then uh, the output was put on a on a writer for the for device 00d for the printer 00d which is connected in turn again with my reader and so my reader notifies here reader query reader oh so we have a bunch, bunch of uh, uh, printout work, printouts uh, working for us, waiting for us. So at first of all, let me put, purge everything. Okay, we'll, and then we'll just do it again. Okay, so now we know we can save this. I do a read card, job one listing, A, on drive A. Okay, and now I can do Type job one listing listing and here's the output from OSVS1. So you can see here we just change it to compile only, no no execution. And as you can see here, there's no chess messages. So even though there is a spooling subsystem which is at work, all this is done, it's it and there is also a strange prefix here which is called EF. And that's the JS1. Those are JS1 messages that we're receiving from OSVS1. And then we have the compilation. There's no errors here that I see. Just uh, compiles it and puts in store. Uh, we know is 5.0 is the opcode for for store. Um, and then we have a macro which puts something on the console and restore register. So that's it. So highest severity uh, was zero, so no errors found. We have the assembler diagnostics, we have the relocation, the, um, the cross-reference, and, uh, and that's it. So this is how we can punch uh, output to, we can use OSVS1. Now, as you can see, it's a quite an archaic system because we lack a lot of the sophistication we have from MBS, and MBS has variable address spaces and as many as you want, so there's no need for the partition. And in MBS, of course, when we do DA, we have a completely different output. Um, but this shows you that OSVS1 is still alive. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we we'll look at a very interesting compiler that's in OSVS1, and that's the uh, PL1 optimizing compiler, which is the the follow-on compiler to the IBM to the MVT PL1 compiler called PL1F compiler because it, it, F stands for 64 kilobyte because the PL1F compiler would fit in 64 kilobyte of real memory on the IBM S360. But with the S370 and OSVS1, uh, IBM released a new compiler called the IBM uh, Optimizing Compiler in 24-bit. They later updated it to 31-bit. It's the one compiler that I actually started programming on back in the 80s when I was a, a young soldier. So um, we're gonna now start experimenting with the PL1 compiler. So to do that, we need to write a short PL1 program and then the JCL around it to invoke the compiler. And then we'll look at the output. So I do have a ready-made job here. Let's 
for the job for that I put together by using the job card that I saw that you saw before. Now the one annoying thing about OS VS1 is that the person who kind of uh, custom made this OS VS1 image, this professor Adolfo Cozzi at a university in Argentina, coded so that this very particular account information has to be provided in the job card or it will not go through. Even if I just change the name, it will try to match match the account with the name. If I don't put this exact say this exact job card, it will not go through. And I tried I will, we'll discuss later why that is, but um, for the moment let's just let's just accept that this is the job card that needs to go in there, so I'll put it in there. And then we invoke the uh, amazing PL1 optimizing compiler. I just have a compile procedure here without uh, link and go. And with this, with this uh, list, with this, let's a few more. And remove that. So uh, with these parameters, and then we have to provide this system library syslib concatenation because of where all these libraries are. And you will see that we can get it, we cannot get it to work. Now sysoutv, that's the writer that goes back to VM370 uh, because uh, this professor who put this image together he kind of wanted it to be run on the VM370 and uh, so he configured here a writer, specifically this one as you can see here for VM, for VM370 so this sysout class will go straight to the uh, reader of my uh, VM370 user so when I try to run this punch job 4 ps one So this was uh, attempted, attempted to execute and then modal access. So it does find the PL1 compiler accessed. And then when I try to, uh, let's get this uh, card here, let's get this uh, listing, read card. Read card. for the listing. So let's see what happens here. Um, so this is again IEF, that's kind of the just one messages. It tells us that it did try to access the PL1 compiler, however, it gives us an event 806, which I know means module not found. So it cannot find this module when it tries to, when it um, unpacks the uh, procedure. So, and then we'll see that this doesn't actually get executed at all. Um, now, one interesting thing is that you remember that we said at the beginning that when we discussed the solution to my quiz from video 100, that the temporary files created by MVT have contained an RV at this position and MBS and up the OS 390 and ZOS contain an A for advanced OS and I mentioned that MFT has an F. Now OS VS1 is as we saw at the beginning of this video is one of the descendants of MFT and as such it has here an F in the temporary data sets as you can see here uh, description. So this is the proof. Um, anyway but we can see that this doesn't go through. Now I try to understand why that is and to do that uh, since we have very limited execution capability even in batch to look at things here we, of course we could do an uh, IBP, IEB uh, patch and, um, and IEB list we could run all those batch jobs but it's a little cumbersome so what I did is I actually uh, copied this whole volume because this is a single volume operating system, everything is on a 3350. 
I copied it to my MVSTK4 environment that I run also in the cloud, and then um, IPL that under VM370 as well. And you can see that here it's actually already running. I press F5, you can see here at TK4. So now we have one and two guest operating systems running. Still, the machine is hardly breaking a sweat. I mean, uh, CPU busy 1%. Two uh, service calls per second, no paging whatsoever. So easy. And uh, so let's get let's let's look into that. So you can see here. Uh, so that's uh, still was VS one, yes. And then I need I have somewhere. not it where is it yeah so here we're connected to it so this is not connected to this TK4 try to follow what I'm doing here so now we're logged into TK4 on the same VM370 mainframe and if we go in here we'll see that I mounted that volume now this is not the same running instance just a copy of it and here we have everything that's in this OSVS1. Now for a second, let's just focus on this screen here. And I should have here somewhere. So let's put this window aside. And I should have... Here it is. Yeah, that's my TK4 console, MBS console. see here this is TSO MF1 this is TK4 running so now we switch to a different operating system okay bear with me here this is just monitoring the system as we go you can see here how many service calls of course if I press enter here and do stuff on the console it will generate system calls so if I you can see here yeah of course this has an impact anyway so but that this is just to keep an eye on things, but let's focus on this window. So this is now everything that's on this OSVS1 single image volume image. And we can see that, of course, there is all the Sys1 data sets are here. For instance, uh, there is a Fortran library, there's an event dump data set, which can be used for analyzing problems. The um, environment recorder here is here. So, because we saw SMF, then uh, um, so this is the EREP environmental recorder, this is the SMF data sets, that's the nucleus from which we IPL'd, and that's the page data set, so everything is on this one volume, and then Parmlib and Proclib, both, or as some people call it, Parmlib and Proclib are there, and then the PL1, uh, the optimizing compiler, library as well as the run li runtime li library which I know happens to be here so we have all these things here and then we have the user proc lib, proc lib and that's the PL1 procedure we just tried to use let's look at it so it's really simple it just try to, it tries to execute IEL OA uh, which is the compiler itself, the first phase of this over. So uh, the optimizer compiler has over a hundred phases. It means it holds about a hundred modules during its compilation. It's a very complex program. And the reason it, it's not all fit in one giant program, like uh, for instance, Chrome, is that people were trying to be uh, memory uh, efficient. I just recently saw that I opened up a very small page that I wrote, web page, two kilobytes without any graphics whatsoever, just text and then measured how much Chrome used on my Windows computer to open that page. So, and to open a two kilobyte page, web page, Chrome had 170 megabytes of memory footprint on my Windows computer. Isn't that crazy? I mean, where did we go wrong when you need almost a gigabyte to open up a two kilobyte page? So back then people were still smart uh, and developers um, wrote this in multiple phases. Anyway. 
and you still you know, it's so blazingly fast you don't get to feel any of it but so this is the way you're supposed to invoke the compiler but I can make it work um, and so what I did instead is since we can get the PL1 compiler to work on OSVS1 and since we and since OSVS1 is batch purely batch operating system everything has to be done from VM370 I copied everything over to our beloved TK4 so that we can run um, the PL1 optimizer compiler on the TK4 now let's go see there's other very nice things in this OSVS1 image such as for instance sort uh, and not the old sort that we use in TK4, this is the um, I sort, the IBM sort, and and maybe I'll do a, a separate video on how to use Iceman, which is, which is another synonym for the IBM sort. And that's, again, that's the new sort, that's not the sort that comes with TK4. And also we have the amazing uh, Fortran uh, compiler, that's the OSVS2 Fortran, a much improved Fortran over Fortran uh, H and G that we had in TK4. Yeah. And of course, we also have an updated uh, COBOL compiler. So, um, this is a very nice image because it contains those. You can see here the COBOL compiler. It does contain kicks, even though this was able to run kicks. OSVS1 had kicks for it, but. Uh, and this is the COBOL compiler. Now, I know. Um, a lot of you people will scream out, hey, those are IBM uh, copyrighted uh, compilers. Yes, I know. I know. And that's my answer to it. I know they're copyrighted compilers. I'm still going to use it. Okay, so you can see here, all this stuff is on this one single volume, VSX REST. So, so since I wanted to run this compiler, let's go here and I have my end queens problem um, made to run with this compiler. So this is my typical um, PL1 program to calculate how many queens we can set on a chessboard so they don't threaten each other. And we make this chessboard uh, 14 by 14. Or let's make 13 by 13. And then we'll try to run it. Now something you'll see, and I did that in the past, when I try to run this, something very funny will happen or actually not that fun but uh, let's run it and you will see that this abandoned with 0c9 which happens to be invalid address so if I go to this pool and try to look at this this was job 195 here it is you will see that this this abandoned and uh, it's, I have a feeling it's because of um, of service calls incompatibility because TK4 has a very particular T uh, service call configuration or SVCs configuration, and I think that's what it's bothering it. However, if I run this a few times, okay, it, it abandoned again. So we just keep running it. Now follow what I'm doing here. It abandoned again. It abandoned again. It abandoned again. It abandoned again. Just bear with me here for a second. And again, and still appending, still appending. Eventually, you'll see that it will go through. And I've had this actually execute just fine. If I try a few times. Well, not today. 
apparently not today. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can find in this pool any execution that actually did go through. Let's, let's cancel all of those. So make sure this pool doesn't fill up. Okay. I'm sure we can find one where it did go through. Um, yeah. So here's one where it did go through. And you can see here in its full glory, PL1 optimizing compiler version 1, release 4. And uh, so if this was in September 7, 2018, a couple of months ago. But um, this went through. And uh, it is indeed faster than the PL1 F compiler from MVT, which is probably about 12 years older compiler than the one we're looking at right now. So it is about 30-40% faster, as well as have a whole bunch of new features. However, uh, there's only one problem, which is that PA1 has two transient libraries. Transient library means runtime libraries. One for multitasking and one for single tasking. And what we have on OSVS1 is, the, is only the single tasking. We don't have the multitasking uh, transient library. But other than that, and I don't really need that anyway, but uh, it's a joy to reuse after 35 years, reuse the same compiler I used back in the 80s, the exact same compiler. So as you can see here, this, when it does go through, it works just fine. Now, I also copied this compiler to, uh, to ZOS at the University of Leipzig, and there it works fine every single time. So uh, that I am able to run this compiler on anything other than OSVS1 and MVS. So if I run it on any newer operating system, it will run just fine. So, uh, so this is about um, PS, uh, OSVS1 and the PL1 uh, Fortran compiler. Maybe I'll make a video about the updated COBOL and Fortran compiler. Um, so, as you can see here, this one didn't go through, but we have enough examples where it did indeed uh, go through. And so, um, as you can see here, this is the still the uh, MVS system running on the same uh, VM370 mainframe. And uh, so we looked at OSVS1, we looked at, um, at uh, the P1 optimizing compiler, and I think uh, we'll stop here. Um, so this was just an, uh, you know, exploring stuff together. So you can watch me as I explore things. And uh, because it's sometimes it's a little bit of work to set all this up. It's not difficult, but set up all this environment with OSVS1 under VM370 and then also copying over to TK4 and IPL and TK4 under VM370 so we can look at the data sets. Um, it, it's, it's not completely trivial. So, but as I said, the interesting things about this OS VS1 is that it has a PL1 compiler, has a Fortran compiler, updated COBOL compiler, but it also has sort. And maybe I'll make a video in the future about how to use sort on VM on MVS 3.8, this updated sort. This is a much, much improved sort, IBM sort over the sort we had in MVT, which anyway requires 23. 14 DASD or disk drives, it's meant to be run on those disk drives where sort is independent uh, of the disk drives. It will run on any of the disk drives we have on uh, MBS 3.8. Um, let's see what else we got here. So DFH, anything that you see with DFH is is uh, kicks. Um, Let's see here. Next. But unfortunately, there is no, um, as far as I know, let's look here. No, there's no, all this is sort. 
those are the sword modules. You can see your eyes, man. But I don't see all oh, this is spiel, spiel one. The stuff here. So unfortunately, I, and of course it has vSAN, um, OSVS1 already included vSAN, but it has no DFH, which means no kicks that we can play with. So somebody ripped that out, probably the person who created this image. But it already has enough stuff, such as this Fortran VS2 compiler. Um, let's see when it was, okay, so this was linkage edited in 1983. So this is how old this image is. This was updated last in 1983. So it makes a 35 years old operating system. Um, distribution. I don't know what this is. This, yeah. So uh, this is kind of the image. Um, you can find it out there in the, on the internet. You can download it. Again here, you can see this temporary data sets. Means MFT. Um, and that's about it. Um, I hope you appreciate the beauty of this OSVS1, such an uh, almost a 50 year old operating system. Oh. And um, and we have looked at PL1 optimizer compiler. Um, I'm always very happy to find this very old compilers. And uh, if you have any questions, please post the questions as uh, comments below this video. If you like this particular video, do press on the thumbs up button. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to the Moshik's main friend channel yet, please do subscribe now. Thank you for watching and goodbye.